We're thankful to the Lord for that. I uh, want to say a special word. Uh, my aunt and uncle are here. Roger and Jeannie Baker are here, and my mom's sister, Jeannie, and great parts of our family. They live in Monat, Missouri, and they're down here to visit, and uh, it's good to have you here. My uncle, he's a, he's, a, he's a big man, and he can be intimidating, but don't let that scare you. He's a teddy bear. Uh, when, he, when I was a kid, I would act real honorary at his house, and he'd say, Noel, I'm going to go back in my room, and I'm going to get my spanking machine and bring it out and use it on you. And I called his bluff. I said, go get it. <laughs> and he didn't, he'd say, I'm not going to bring it out yet. Anyway, it's good to have them here uh, to be with us. We appreciate their, their love and their prayers and their support. They're, they're great people. Uh, we're coming up on revival, and uh, I thought, what in the world could we do to get ready for revival? And I thought, you know what, let's look at what happened in the Old Testament and different parts of the Bible when revival broke out. What precipitated that revival? And so we're going to look at a, a passage of Scripture today in your Bibles, Second Chronicles chapter 34, if you'll turn there in your Bibles. And I'm going to have Pastor Bob come, and if he would, and to read that for us aloud. Second Chronicles chapter 34. Hear the word of the Lord. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, carved idols, and cast images. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles, the idols, and the images. These he broke into pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and so he purged Judah and Jerusalem. In the towns of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon and Naphtali and in the ruins around them, he tore down the altars and the Asherah poles and crushed the idols to powder and cut, the piece, cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout Israel. Then he went back to Jerusalem. In the 18th year of Josiah's reign, to purify the land and the temple, he sent Shapan, the son of Azaliah, and Mes Messiah, the ruler of the city, and Joah, son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the temple of the Lord. They went to Hilkiah, the high priest, and gave him the money that had been brought into the temple of God, which the Levites, who were the doorkeepers, had collected from the people of Manasseh, Ephraim, and the entire remnant of Israel, from all the people of Judah and Benjamin and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Then they entrusted it to the men appointed to supervise the work on the Lord's temple, these men paid the workers who repaired and restored the temple. The book of the law was found. Go down to verse 14. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken in the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given to Moses. Hilkiah said to Shapan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shapan. Then Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, Your officials are doing everything that can be committed to them. They have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and entrusted it to the supervisors and the workers. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah, to Achim, son of Shaphan, Abdom, the son of Micah, and Shapim, the secretary of Isaiah, the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the remnant of Israel and Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with what is written in this book. Hilkiah and those that the king had sent with him went to speak to the prophetess Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tokath, the son of Hazra, the keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the second district. She said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the men who sent you to me, This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people, all the curses written in the book that have been read in the presence of the king of Judah. 
because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and provoked me by anger by all their hands have made, my anger will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before God when you heard what he spoke against this place and its people, and because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Now I will gather you to your fathers and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place and those who live here. So they took their answer back to the king. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord and the men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, and all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commands and regulations and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, and to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. Then he had everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledge themselves to it. People of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the territory belonging to the Israelites. And he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their fathers. The reading of God's word. Amen. Thank you. Wow. Smash your idols. Smash your idols. When I look at that story, I see there is a lot of destruction going on. There, there, is a lot, there are a lot of things going on in this story that I think, precipitated a revival in the land. You think, well, could that happen in America? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's got to start with the church, though. It's not going to start with the White House. It's got to start with the church house, that we, as the people of God, must repent and turn from our wicked ways before we're pointing a long finger at the White House and the Congress and the Senate. They're not the issue. Peter tells us that judgment will begin in the house of the Lord. It'll start here. The reason the White House is in the condition it is is because the church has not been in the condition that she should be in. We must be a praying people, and we, as Christians, must smash our idols. If we're so caught up in sin that we can't see straight, how is the White House ever going to see straight? We, as a people of God, must smash our idols. Revival is coming. Now, we can't schedule a revival per se, but we can say we want to set this time aside to get our hearts aright with God, to align ourselves with the Father in heaven. 2 Chronicles 34 is a picture there, that the smashing of things that happened. There was blessed subtraction happening all over Judah. Now, Israel is not very big geographically. It's about the size of New Jersey. In fact, if you put the United States over the top of of Israel, It'd just be a little sliver in the very center of the whole United States. Very small. In fact, the area that we're talking about that the revival happened in, it's just about 40 miles north and south and about 40 miles east and west. A very small area. But Josiah was drastic in what he did to bring about reform. J.I. Packer said this, Revival is the visitation of God which brings to life Christians who have been sleeping and restores a deep sense of God's near presence and holiness. Thence springs a vivid sense of sin and a profound exercise of heart and repentance, praise and love with an evangelistic outflow. That's what we can expect to happen when our hearts are revived. Josiah becomes king at age eight. Second grade, third grade, think about that. He become, now, no doubt he had attendants and aides that helped him to help govern, but he was the king at age eight, eight years of age. Listen, we shouldn't discount our young people. We shouldn't say, oh, well, we'll have to wait till they get older and then we'll mess with them. No. Josiah was eight years old when he became the king of Judah, the southern part of the kingdom. Eight years old. Can you imagine a second grader becoming the king of the United States? If they were godly, I'd say, bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> we need some godliness. 
There's some small print there. In his eighth year as king, Josiah began to seek the Lord. So eight plus eight, he's 16 now. He's 16. He begins to seek the God of his father, David. He must be kind of thinking about, where did I come from? And a lot of 16-year-olds begin to ask these questions. Who am I and what am I going through? And so King Josiah at age 16 begins to seek the Lord. Is it okay for 16-year-olds to seek the Lord? I kind of wonder if revival would break out in the young. It seemed like that happens a lot. Jesus' disciples were all pretty young and turned the world upside down through these young people. Josiah seeks the Lord. He gets his driver's license and he's seeking the Lord. He's seeking the Lord. In his 12th year, 12 plus 8, now he's 20. He's 20 years old. He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. See what happened? He sought the Lord and what happened from him seeking? Seeking the Lord led to, we've got to get rid of some stuff. We, there's stuff all through this land that's weighing us down. We've got to get rid of it. And then his 18th year, 18 plus 8, he's 26 now. Josiah began to repair the house of the Lord, which signified the presence of God in their land. And he did, you see the three things he did there? He sought the Lord. He began to destroy idols around him. And then he began to repair the house of the Lord. And it was in that year that they found the law of God, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the law. So what did it look like when Josiah began to seek the Lord? Hint, hint, this is what it looked like for you to seek the Lord too. What did it look like in Josiah's life when he began to seek the Lord? Look at this passage. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles, the idols and the images. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. That's drastic. Revival is not for wimps. <laughs> Revival is not for sissies or faint of heart. To have revival, you must do some things to say, God, my heart is ready for you to enter in. An Asherah pole is a sacred tree or a pole that stood near Canaanite religious locations to honor the mother goddess Asherah. And so they took axes and they would just cut these things down. Let me tell you, whenever you are doing things like this, people around you will notice. They will notice when you're serious with God. Are you serious with God? Or are you just humdrum, oh, another service? Do you want God more than anything else? Do you have a hunger and a thirst for God in your heart? Do your children and your grandchildren see in you a hunger and a thirst for God? Do you want Him more than anything else? Exodus 34, 13, But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. This is serious business. Remember, Moses went up on the mountain to, to pray and get the Ten Commandments, and Aaron, his brother, falls prey to the people's wishes, and they build a golden calf and begin to bow down and worship. Burned it, ground it, scattered it. There's three words right here. Look at this. And Moses took the calf they had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. Put a metallic taste in their mouth. Ugh. That's what idols will do to you. It just makes you, ugh, terrible. See, you do something drastic to get rid of idols. You have to do something drastic. The idols will not walk out of the house on their own. You, as a believer in God, must do something to prepare your heart for revival. Do you really want revival? Do you really want revival? Because when you have revival, your life will change. You can't continue to see the same things you're seeing and do the same things you're doing and say the same words you're saying. Revival happens whenever you say, Lord, I want you to do anything in my heart. I'm going to get rid of anything that would impair or impede my walk with you. Do you really want to do that? Most of us would say, no, I like my life, I like my job, I like the way it's going, I like my entertainment, even if it's a little bit dirty, I like my music, I like my, I like my entertainment. Pastor, don't, don't mess with me on this stuff, I like this stuff. Well, that stuff will weigh you down. It's like an 80-pound money belt. You may like it, but you get thrown in water and you're going to sink. You need to get rid of that 80-pound money belt to save yourself. What is in your life that's pulling you down? Leviticus 26.30 and I will destroy your high places, God says, and cut down your images and cast your carcasses on the carcasses of your idols. Drastic again. Smashing idols. Look what Josiah did, verse 5. Josiah burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and so he purged Judah and Jerusalem. I don't know what it's like to burn bones. It must be a pretty hot fire. He burned bones and scattered them. 
Is Josiah serious? You better believe it. He is serious about revival. God knows when we're serious because our actions begin to show it. We can give lip service all day long. Oh, God, I want revival. You know how bad I want revival. But our life keeps going the same exact way. Will you do something drastic? Will your family know that you want revival in your heart? Look further, verse 7. Josiah tore down the altars and the asher poles and crushed the idols to powder and cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout Israel. Serious again. The Israelites who were there went out of the towns of Judah, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the asher poles. They destroyed the high places and the altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh. This is the southern kingdom of Israel. After they had destroyed all of them, the Israelites returned to their own towns and to their own property. See, it, didn't, it wasn't just Josiah. It spilled out to the people, the people of God. They began to say, you know what? Our leader is doing this. I'm going to do it too. And they began to destroy all these things around them that were wicked and defiled and awful to see in God's presence. High places were places of worship on elevated pieces of ground or raised altars and were originally dedicated to idol worship. These shrines often included an altar and a sacred object such as stone pillar or wooden pole in various shapes identified with the object of worship. Animals, constellations, goddesses, and fertility deities. High places, you know. Like TVs, you know, we put them up high. Where we... Wait a second, I'm not, it's too close to home. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. This isn't just the old Israelites. This is 2015 Arkansans that we have idols in our life that we must smash. When I was a kid, I remember there'd be a revival, and I remember uh, when I was really young, the teens would gather together all their 8-track tapes. Remember those? You remember 8-track tapes? And they'd bring those, and there'd be a big bonfire out in the country, and we'd have rocks around, and we'd start a fire, and we'd throw our our bad 8-track tapes, you know, those those bad things, because they were putting bad stuff in our mind. And we said, you know what, if we want God, we can't hold on to the bad stuff and say, God, please bless me. We had to get rid of the evil. The 8-tracks didn't just walk out of our home. We had to actually do something with them. We had to burn them. And, we, and then some people brought like, remember the vinyl records? They'd burn those things. I'm sure it's like a, a hazard to the, to the environment, but somehow we made it, you know. But I remember being serious about that, and something happened when I was serious. Something happened in the hearts of my friends when they were serious about getting rid of anything evil in their home. Charles Wesley saying, Oh, that in me the sacred fire might now begin to glow. Burn up the dross of base desire and make the mountains flow. Is that our heart's cry? I remember uh, being a youth pastor and there was a, there was a kid named Oscar and he went to camp. And that camp, the teen camp, they're talking about getting rid of any idols in your life. And, and Oscar brought a, an iPod with him to camp. He wasn't supposed to. No technology at camp. Just focus on God. He brought that thing and he was so convicted because he had all kinds of filthy, filthy, filthy songs about sex and about killing others. and It was just graphic nature of songs. And he took his iPod out to this big lake called Table Rock. And he took that thing and he threw that iPod out into the water. And all of his buddies were going, why did you just delete the songs? That's what he felt like God wanted him to do. He got rid of his iPod. The next year there was a drought. Water was way down. We went to camp the next year, and Oscar's down there and walking around, and all of a sudden he sees something in the, in the rocks, in the mud, and he pulls it up, and it's his old iPod, rusty. He kept that thing as a remembrance. I gave this to God. This is his. This old destroyed iPod, this is God's. I'm telling you, it's drastic. You say, well, that's teens, you know, just teens. They'll get kind of crazy every once in a while. They'll get kind of excited for God. Does it have to be just the teens? Can we not say, God, I'm willing to give my whole self to you. Anything that is slowing me down, I want to get rid of it, Lord. Leonard Ravenhill said this, how can you pull down strongholds of Satan if you don't even have the strength to turn off your TV? I'm not against TV. I have a TV. 
But if TV controls us, we need to turn the thing off. We need to just get along with God and say, Lord, I want to, I want to spend more time with you than I do with that TV. Every time I watch that TV, I just get angry anyway. So why would I want to watch it? Turn away from that. Say, Lord, I want to give myself to you. There's a man that, that heard a message on revival, and he had, uh, he had a program on cable. That was a movie channel. He felt very convicted about it. He heard the sermon, and, and, and somebody said, well, you know what? Why don't you just get rid of cable? Why don't you just get rid of that channel even? Just do something. And he went home, and he called the cable provider, and he said, I want to take this movie channel off. It's causing me sin. He even said it to the lady on the other end. She's like, uh, Okay. <laughs> and he said, I'm telling you, that's evil, and I shouldn't have it, and I'm sorry. He was repenting to this lady on the phone who wasn't even a Christian. He's saying, I just feel bad. And she said, oh, okay, all you have to do is just tell me to turn it off. <laughs> but he did. He got rid of that cable channel because it was causing him to sin. And let me tell you, there are people in this church that are struggling with that right now. And you're struggling, and you're struggling, and you're wondering, why can't I get over this? It's because you're allowing that idol to stay in your home. How do you expect to win with having an idol right there in your home? We must get rid of the idols in our home. Jesus said this, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Does that make sense? Come into heaven, one eye. You go, what was your problem? Oh, can't you tell? I had a problem with what I saw. I had to pluck my eye out. He's not talking about literal thing there. He's talking about get rid of anything in your life that would cause you to sin. Don't play around with sin. It always hurts you more than you think it will. Exodus 25, you shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God gets jealous. God says, Noel, why would you go running after that other thing? I am the real God. Come to me. God is jealous. He'll come after us. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, as Pastor Bob read, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Isn't that interesting? It's amazing what happens. When you start getting rid of all the good, what you've got left is you've got the Bible there. Get into it. Spend time in it. Shapen read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the Lord, he tore his robes. It was a sign of mourning. He was like, oh my goodness, look at America. We've got abortion. We've got homosexual marriage. We've got all these things going on, and everybody says black is white, white is black. Nothing is wrong anymore. It's all moral, moralistic, whatever, relativism. When you get into the Word of God, you start going, oh my goodness, how can we let babies be murdered? How can we let people have homosexual marriage? Can't we as a Christian people at least say something? Can't we say something in love, say something to those around us? We have lost our tongue. We've lost our mouth. We've lost our heart. We've lost our courage. And we are weak need Christians. Maybe, maybe we're Christians. Maybe we're not Christians. Maybe the reason we have no strength to stand up against these things is because we're not Christian. Are we grieved at the things that grieve the heart of God? Lord, help us. Lord, help me. Help me. Your pastor, Lord, help me. The Lord says, I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people. All the curses written in the book that has been read in the presence of King of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and have provoked me to anger by all that their hands have made, my anger will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. I mean, that's judgment. I kind of wonder what's going to happen to the good old USA. Who do we think we are? Do we think we get a pass because we had a Christian beginning? God could rightfully now just destroy America and wouldn't have to explain anything to anybody. We have violated His commands. We have turned away from Him. And we say, oh God, please bless me. And we're caught up in the evil just like the world? Tell the king of Judah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, because your heart was responsive, that's us, respond, and humbled yourself before God when you heard what he spoke against his place and his people, because you humbled yourself before me, tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you. Did you know God will hear you when you repent? When you actually turn away from your idols, you say, God, I want you more than anything else. God hears that prayer. God will bend his anger and he'll give you mercy through Jesus Christ alone. The king stood by pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep His commands, regulations, and decrees with all His heart and with all His soul to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. 
The king did that. I want to tell you that the church or the body of Christ is a living organism. We are a living organism. And this church wants to grow. This church wants to grow spiritually. And when you have a body, an organism, that wants to grow, what stops that from growing? It's disease that comes over the top of that. Disease in our bodies. And so what does the doctor do? The doctor doesn't try to make us not human. The doctor tries to get the disease out of our life. And when the disease is out of your life, your body, your organism will naturally want to grow and be healthy. This church wants to be healthy. This is the bride of Christ. The only thing that can stop it is us with putting sin in our life and saying, I'm going to hold on to my sin. I don't care what happens. I'm telling you, you will not grow. You are diseased. And you can disease the church. Billy Sunday was asked by a lady, why do you keep having revivals when it doesn't last? And he asked her, why do you keep taking baths? We need a fresh touch, don't we, church? I'm happy to be here. I love you, and I feel like you love me. Thanks for the words of encouragement this morning, Mel. Thank you. I feel like we're a great team. And I'm not angry at you. I'm angry at sin. I'm angry at the things that are going on even in the church or in the world that cause us not to have God's best. Don't you want God's best? Don't you hunger and thirst for more of God in your life? Your marriages are falling apart because you don't have God at the center. Your kids are running pow-mow after the world because you're not talking to them about the things of God and modeling for them the things of God. Grandkids wonder what's right, what's wrong. We have no ethical standards anymore. Is there anything that's truly right and truly wrong? And grandkids are wondering this. What about homosexuality? Hey, if it doesn't bother anybody else, what's it matter? Because God said it's wrong. That's why. So we have to tell them these things. Billy Sunday also said, if you don't do your part, don't blame God. God, I wish you'd do revival here. Well, if you don't do your part, don't blame God. If revival is held up in this place, it's because of one of us, right? It's because of one of us. We're saying, I'm gonna hold, I'd rather have sin than God. I'd rather have my habit than God. I'd rather have my pet sin than God. And God says, okay, free will, go ahead. See how that works out for you. How do you measure your love relationship with Jesus? By examining the relationship you have with your enemies in the church. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. The person you hate the most in the church, that's your rate of relationship with Jesus. If you have ought against a brother or sister in this church, do everything possible to make it right. Do everything possible. Make it right. I've been praying that we'll have people at these altars crying and hugging one another, people that are enemies. I've been praying that God would do such a work in our hearts that there'd be nothing that would stop us from God's presence in our lives. Nothing. Are we going to let little hang-ups, little grudges keep us from having revival? Are we going to keep, let those things keep us out of heaven? They will. Those things will keep us out of heaven. Oh, I want that habit so bad. Is it worth going to hell over? No. Ask the Lord to show you anything in your life that's not like him. Say, Lord, I want to get rid of that. I want to smash idols in my life. Revival, says G. Campbell Morgan, cannot be organized, but we can set our sails to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. Set your sail. Put your sail up and say, God, I want to catch the wind. You got to get rid of the stuff. Put your sail up and wait on him. Theodore Cooler said, it will require more than a few hours of fasting and prayer to cast out such demons as selfishness, worldliness, and unbelief. Repentance, to be of any avail, must work a change of heart and of conduct. I heard a story about a, two church board members, a, a male and a female. Billy and Sally, we'll call them. They were at such odds in this church that they would actually say mean things to each other in the board meeting and would kind of get on each other in the board meeting and yell at each other. They were at each other's throats. The pastor would try to pray, would try to work with them. Nothing availed. They had a revival. At the end of one of the services of the revival, the evangelist said, does anybody want to testify? Because there's a great work of God done in the sanctuary. And the man stood up and said, hey, a lot of you know I've been at odds with Sally, and I'm going to take off the boxing gloves. I'm done. I want to just say right now, I'm holding out an olive branch. I want to say, would you forgive me? It was quiet in the church. The lady stood up, and she said, 
Billy, I forgive you, and I'm sorry for saying what I did in front of the whole church because they all knew about it in front of the whole church. And I want to tell you, revival broke out in that church because two leaders said, I will put aside my differences and I will follow Jesus. Is that possible today? I believe it's possible that there'd be no ought in this church. Now, I, I prayed about saying that to you, and I feel like I can say that because we serve the God of the impossible. So God can do more than I can think or imagine, more than I can ask or imagine. Billy and Sally reconciled in that church, and they prayed together. A beautiful thing. And I thought, how did that happen? It's because two people said they wanted God more than they wanted to win. Are you at odds with somebody in this church? Do everything possible to be at peace with all men. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, Jesus said, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest and not finding any. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, the demon, it finds swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. I wonder if there is some demonic control in this church, like any church. I mean, Satan wants to work on this. If you want to find the devil, go to church, right? I mean, he has the world. If you want to find the devil, go to church. And if there are people here that are under his control, under his tutelage, it's going to be bad. And we can get rid of all the stuff, and we can throw it out, we can clean house, but Jesus said unless that house is occupied, the demons go out and get seven more and bring them back, and you're worse off at the end than you were at the beginning. So it's not just a matter of getting rid of the stuff in your home. It's saying, Lord, I'm getting rid of the stuff so that you might fill every room of my heart. Don't just get rid of the stuff. That doesn't do any good. That gives you a big space for Satan to come in. Fill your heart with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him live in you and have reign and dominion over you. Revival begins with you. Two things, smashing idols and seeking God through his word. They sought God. Josiah sought the Lord, found his word, read it. They had revival. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. What idols do you need to smash? Well, pastor, we're a part of a holiness church. I have no idols to smash. Pride might be the first one for me. I was talking to some folks about getting everything out of their home, and this one couple, they said, you know what, we've got some, uh, some, we've got some wine in our house. It's controlling us. We can't stop, but we, we need to get right with God. And they knew they couldn't do it by leaving the wine in there, and so they went home and they called their daughters into the room and said, daughters, get down here, two teenage daughters. Come in here, come in here, come in here. And they came in, they, they uncorked these, all these wine bottles, and they started boop, boop, boop down the drain. These daughters are like, Dad, what are you doing? That's expensive stuff. And he goes, it's an idol for me, and i got to get rid of it. Boop, 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 boop. It's drastic is what I'm saying. This isn't just smashing a, a real idol of wood or stone, but there might be some things in your home that you need to get rid of today. Don't wait until next week. Get rid of them today. I'm calling our church to pray and fast. Wednesday, we have corporate prayer at 6 o'clock. This is a high and holy day this Wednesday for us to get together, I believe, as a church to pray for revival. Every man, every woman, I'm calling you. Every teenager, don't go in the youth room. Come in here. Children, don't go. It's locked anyway. We lock it so you can't get in there. Come and pray. We, we close the whole church down so we can pray. When is a good time to pray? When, when everybody's not busy. Right. There's no good time. <laughs> There's not a good time. You go, well, 6 o'clock is such a hard time. We'll pick one for me that's better. You want to do midnight on Tuesdays? I mean, there's no good time. Let me just say this. We've set aside a time. I know not everybody can make it. If you're at the hospital and you're working the ship, you can't get here. You've got to, but if you can get away, you can take your lunch 30 minutes earlier or take less of a lunch. And I want to be here and I want to take my kids and I want to pray because we're going to seek God together as a church. And maybe to fast. I'm asking you to choose a day. Choose a 24-hour period and say, I'm going to fast. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat anything. I'm not going to eat chocolate. I'm not going to drink coffee. I'm, giving, I'm, I'm going to drink water. Pastor, what are you talking about here? I'm being drastic because we need to be drastic. We've got some heavy idols in this place that we've got to get rid of. And we can't just sit here and smile at each other and pray like, oh, I hope it happens. We've got we to lift a finger. 
If revival doesn't happen, don't blame God. 24-hour period. You pick. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to eat, eat chocolate. I'm not going to drink my coffee. I'm not going to have my Dr. Pepper. I'm not going to have my sweets. I'm going 24 hours, and I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to pray. When I, when I should be eating, I'm going to have my Bible open. How about a social media fast? Saturday and Sunday of next week. Get ready. No Facebook. No Instagram. No Facebook. We can't live, Pastor, without Facebook. I look at that before I look at my Bible. That might be your problem. How about next Saturday and Sunday as we prepare for revival? No social media. That's up to you. I can't force this, but I'm saying if anybody here hungry for revival, that you'll do these things. If you're a senior adult, you're like, oh, that was an easy one for me. <laughs> I, don't ha- I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord, you're an example for us. Wish I could be more like you. No social media. Turn, how about turn off that TV, that radio, and say, I'm going to give my time to the Lord. Some of you senior adults know what I'm talking about. You remember the old-time revivals that happened, and the, the community was transformed. People's lives were changed, and people would just be so in love with Jesus that they're, they're, they couldn't be the same way anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Remember those days? Do you want that in your life today? Do you want your kids to see what that looks like, your grandkids? Pray, pray, pray. I gave you something in your bulletin. Miss Norma helped make this up. This preparation for personal revival questions. Got them all folded in there. Maybe that's your family devotions. There's a ton of questions. Three sheets of typed questions. Maybe you go through that in your family devotions. You go, what are those? Well, that's whenever you get your family together and you talk about the Bible or Jesus, right? I'm being facetious. I know you know. But call your family together. Say, Pastor, we don't have them. It's never too late to do the right thing. So start this week. Call your moms. If, if your husbands are not, if they're spiritually delinquent, they're out to lunch. Moms, you do this. You call your family together. Dads, if you're in the home and you've got a little bit of a spiritual pulse, which a lot of you do, call your family together and say, we need to pray. Go through some of these questions, a few of them a night. I'm giving you some practical things that we can do to get ready for revival. Say this scripture with me from Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Point out anything in me that makes you sad and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Let that be your prayer. That's in that sheet, those sheets I gave you. Go home. Lock yourself in your room. Kneel down in the middle of the floor and with a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself. There on your knees, pray fervently and brokenly that God would start a revival within that chalk circle. Me. Pray that your pastor be right. You pray for yourself. I'll pray for me. Pray for yourself. God, let the revival begin in that circle. I really do think it's going to be a family thing. God created a family, and he wants to redeem families. It's not one person in the family. It's the whole family. It usually starts with the dad getting humble, saying, I want revival. Dads, it starts with us. Moms, if you're going it alone, you start. You lead your family. You bring them. Grandparents, you're praying for your kids, your grandkids. I want them all at the altar. I want, to, I want to pray. And I want to give us a challenge this morning that as we close this service, I want us to, to pray together as families and say, God, is there anything in our life? Is there anything in our life that's impeding revival?